If you've been following along, uh, coming here, you definitely be hearing the uh, Jesus Wasn't Talking to You series, nicknamed Jay Witty. Um, so in that series, we're, we're seeing contrast and a comparison of the different messages um, that Christ brought to, the, to Israel and the difference between his message and the message that Paul got and the, the different dispensations. And I think he's, he does a good job of that, and I hope to tie this message in with that series, just kind of piggyback. So um, when you have to prepare a message to piggy against, against your own brother, or piggyback against your own brother, uh, there's, it's not a competition, but I, <laughs> it seems like it's a competition, right? <laughs> So, uh, I'm not, I don't want to make it that, is my point. Uh, what, I, what I want to do is I, I tend to look at different things in life, uh, just in my everyday life, and I try to understand them better by, you know, the light bulb goes off. You say, oh, well, I can apply that. So, I'm going to try to do that today, and the things that I've been going through, the things that I see on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, but what I wanted to say was I appreciate the time he puts in to that Absolutely. and uh, he, he does put in a lot of time and when you have to prepare a lesson and you have everything else going on in your life you see what he does every week back to back to back and so I appreciate it I'm sure you appreciate it he doesn't like accolades <laughs> he said to stop <laughs> So we see the comparison that, that Paul has and the message that Jesus brought to Israel. And we see the contrast between the church, the body of Christ, and the law being fulfilled by Jesus on the cross. And in Matthew 5.17 we can read that. Let's start there. In Matthew 5.17, Jesus is talking. He says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am, come, I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And also that's backed up by Romans 15.8. In Romans 15, 8, the verse says, Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. He fulfilled the law. He fulfilled it. But now if we take a look at Colossians 2, 14, we can see a distinct difference between the law and what is in place now. Colossians 2.14. Oh, what's happening here? Blotting out the handwriting of ordinance that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. If we continue reading in 15, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing, triumphing over them. Let no man therefore judge you in meat, or in drink, or in respect of a holy day, or the new moon, or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. 
Now, to me in those verses, it sure sounds like we're not supposed to be following the law. But how can you follow them if they're blotted out and nailed to the cross? Because they were fulfilled. But I'm supposed to tithe. The pastor is my shepherd. I could go on and on about the different references referring to the law. Why do we try to put the church back under the law? How do I follow it if it's blotted out? Now, that doesn't mean I can't learn it. If something is nailed to the cross, and Christ was complete in the finished work of the cross, why would I want to go back under that? Most churches, most, most of Christianity, they don't even realize they're being put back under the law. And they'll say, see God's commandments to you? Look at all the things you're supposed to be doing. But they pick and choose, right? They pick and choose what you're supposed to be doing. In some way, it's almost what's most convenient for that particular denomination, that particular church, that particular shepherd. According to Colossians 2.10, I'm already complete in him. He's the head of all principality and power. You can't go any higher. He's the top boss. He's the kingpin. Top dog. Right? You can't get any higher authority. It doesn't matter if you say I'm a shepherd of a flock. Christ is the ultimate authority. I have that on the authority of God's own word in verse 10. The best part about that is I don't have to do anything. I have no more work to do. All I had to do was believe in the finished work of Jesus' death on the cross. We find that in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1 through 4. In Colossians 1, 14. Again, reading that. Blotting out the handwritten ordinance of that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it away, nailing it to the cross. Christ died. We hear it. We believe it. We're sealed. I don't have a job to do. I don't have a work to do. I don't have the tithe to put in the offering plate. I'm not counting on a sprinkling of the water or a baptism being dunked. The redemption comes through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. So many times growing up, I read over these verses, it it just did not click. You read them, and you don't connect the dots. Steve says sometimes, I gathered a lot of the dots, but I couldn't connect them. But until someone comes up to you and puts a book in your face and says, can you explain to me the difference between this and this? Why does it seem like they say two different things? Because they do. Now, 
Now, he, he didn't slap me over the head with it, but this particular guy, I think his term was, see, you see? Can you tell me, how can you believe both? Tell me. I said, I don't, I don't know. I can't tell you. It has to be two different things, right? Well, yeah, it sure looks like it. He's come a long way. So have I. <laughs> we all have, yeah, that's true. How can these two things apply to you personally today? How can Paul, in Romans 16, 24, He kept pointing out all these references and said, my gospel, my gospel. Romans 16, 24, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. This is the, the last part of this letter. And 25 says, now to him that is the power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. See, there's a difference there. People, a lot of times they'll say, well, you guys are Paul lovers. In, in a way... But not, we're not in love with Paul, we're in love with his message. Amen. The gospel that he brings. Because who does he preach? Jesus Christ. We're not following Paul, we're following his gospel message. We're following Jesus Christ. According to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now... Always that but now. Is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. Let's go back to Colossians. I should have told you to keep your, keep your finger there. Colossians 1.24 Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake which is the church. Wherefore I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you. To fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which hath been hid from the ages, from generations, but now is made manifest to the saints. Jesus Christ wasn't preaching the mystery. He was fulfilling the law and the prophets. This is new. Verse 26 again, even the mystery which hath been hid from the ages from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you. The hope of glory, whom we preach. We're not preaching Paul. We're preaching his gospel. Warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom. <coughs> ah, you silly dispensationalists. We're preaching wisdom. We need to remember that when we're confronted with someone who is coming against us. When we see the nasty emails, <coughs> and we're trying to, trying to teach you wisdom. That we may present every man perfect in the law. No. That we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. In verse, 20, verse 29 it says, whereunto, whereunto I also labor striving according to his 
working, which worketh in me mightily. If you let it, the gospel given to Paul, the wisdom that we were trying to edify other saints with, it'll work in you mightily. You can reach others. The mystery, the dispensation of grace, the stakes are pretty high because there's a lot of churches out there who are not preaching the right gospel and they're teaching their congregation to go straight to hell. And it's a sad commentary. When I originally saw this, I was driving down the road. Actually, I was driving on the expressway. And it's an analogy that I, I thought, man, that, that'd probably be a pretty good message. And I apologize to some of you if this applies to you, but I'm going to use it. And you, some of you may see it when you're driving down the road, when you're driving on the expressway. I see people who are trying to live by Old Testament law, but also sprinkle in the grace. They want a little bit of this. They want the blessings, but they also want that grace. So they kind of got two feet on both sides. They're riding the fence, or they're trying to tiptoe, right? Trying to keep their balance. That way they don't get too far into the law, because we don't want the cursings, right? We want the blessings, but we don't want the cursings. You want the storehouses full. Uh, you want your clothes to last for 40 years. You want your shoes to last for 40 years. Amen, right? <laughs> you may ask, how, how do you know that when you see somebody driving down the road, you know that they're trying to, they're trying to keep some of that law and keep some of that grace? Well, it's pretty simple. I see him driving with both feet on, one foot on the brake, one foot on the gas. I'm going down the expressway, I was like, yep, that looks like somebody's on the fence. Got their brake, light, brake lights on, but they're passing you. <laughs> what, am I seeing things here? Yeah, how can you, how can you uh, drive so fast with your brakes on? Two-footed drivers. One foot on the brake, one foot on the gas, yes. I say, oh man, if I could just box them in in a parking lot somewhere, I could help them out, brother. It just happened a couple weeks ago, it was on the expressway, and I thought maybe the lights were stuck on, and I, I was kind of sped up. You know, I followed this car, I'm like, man, that, is that right? Are they just stuck on? But no, the brakes did go off, so I know that they're working both of them at the same time. Isn't that interesting how you just driving down the road, you can see, man, that's, that's a good analogy. Somebody driving with both feet. They want to be Israel, but they want to, they want to have the grace, right? Same thing happened on a four-lane road. I was driving somewhere, four-lane road. Whew. That guy's got his brake lights on. <laughs> but what's interesting is if, if they take their brake, their foot off the brake, they're going to get there a lot more efficiently, probably a lot faster. You're not going to wear out your car. I think we all tend to get that two-footed issue going sometimes. We want to look at our circumstances. We want to look at our physical things and say, Lord, why are you doing that to me? Take your foot off the brake. You're not Israel. Stop looking at the physical. I need to break some news to you. And here's the facts. If you're trusting in Christ's completed work on the cross for your salvation, you've already been blessed. But it's not with this. It's not with the physical. Ephesians chapter 1, 3 through 9. Let's look at that.
Verse 3, Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings. No, no, no. Sorry, I said that right. Hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in earthly places in Christ. No, don't say that. It says, In heavenly places, according as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before love in Him having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. I want you to understand that the predestination was the fact that he kept it a secret. He kept the mystery. Jesus Christ is the ultimate tactician. in war. In verse 6 it says, To the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved, in whom we have, in whom we have redemption through His blood for the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. having made known unto us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure, which He hath purposed in Himself. We are the dispensation of grace, which was a mystery that was given to Paul it's not something the world knew about. If Satan would have known about it, he would have never crucified Jesus Christ. Jump over to Colossians 3.2. In Colossians 3, 2, we're supposed to set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Keep your focus in the right place. So we start to look at our earthly circumstances and start asking for prayer and praying about why God is doing this or that to us. And we look at... Uh, Things we don't have enough money for. It, it's why our storehouses aren't full. We're looking in the wrong place. Let's go to Ephesians 6.12. This verse has given me a whole new outlook. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual weakness in high places. In that passage it talks about using the armor of God because you're going to be in a fight. It's a spiritual fight. The reason that verse has a whole new meaning for me is, is some of you know I started doing something uh, in the past couple weeks that I've, I've always wanted to. And I got into martial arts. I've always wanted to get into it. And I started, uh, I started trying to do <laughs> the best of my ability <laughs> is uh, a a martial art called jujitsu. And it's incredible. And it gives you a whole different perspective on verse 12. Jujitsu is combat 
without essentially punching somebody or kicking somebody in the face. It is a martial art that puts you in an arm bar, a shoulder lock, or you try to get choked out. You try to choke your opponent out. It is an art that if your opponent does not submit, tap out, you could potentially break their limb or their hand or cut off the blood flow. It's great fun. <laughs> it's something that has given me a, a whole new perspective again on this verse. And if you want to be taught humility, try it. It's a humbling experience. I went to uh, a competition just yesterday uh, with the guys that I train with. And when you look at the, this martial art, you are essentially in direct combat with another human being, and you're, you are fighting without punching them in the face. And you have to move your body in a way you're trying to control your body enough and move your body in a way that you are ultimate control. And unless they do something to tell you, I give up, or tap, you could really hurt them. And again, in, in my mind, I look at that and I say, how applicable is that to Christianity today? And so I'm watching, I'm watching this competition. I'm watching all, all these guys that I train with have choked me out and have put me in arm bars, and I'm cheering them on. Come on, get him. Yeah. And you're literally using leverage and technique against a guy that could be potentially much bigger than you. And it's incredible to watch. I got choked out by a guy that was up to my chin. And I don't feel bad about it, and neither does he. But I'm watching the competition, and I see these coaches, and they're trying to instruct their guys. Kick your leg over. Make sure you don't get that, that underhook. Don't let him get hooks in. Get your feet out. Move your arm over. And the other coach is yelling at his guy, too. Don't let him do that. Watch out for that. Keep your head up. And so I imagine the people who are looking at the physical. And I see that. And I see Satan trying to take focus off of heavenly places and put them back here on earth. And I see God over here saying, Get off the mat! Stop fighting! You're fighting for the wrong thing. Your hope, your focus should be in heaven, not here on earth. Amen. And I see Satan saying, no, look at this. Look what happened over here. It's a fight. And God's saying, get up off the mat. And fighting, Satan's pulling you back down. I always tell this every, I think every message. Study to show yourself approved. Why do we study? So we don't have to be ashamed. We have to rightly divide. If we don't, and our focus isn't in heavenly places, we're not going to be effective ambassadors for our home. And if you don't think Satan is in every single church trying to pull the focus of Christianity off of heaven, 
and get it back here to get people to walk away. And you're absolutely wrong. He wants our focus based on earthly things. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. This isn't our fight. Like I said, it's a much higher stake. The souls of men are at stake. Amen. That's true. Edification of our, the saints preaching wisdom to them, helping them understand that we have a better deal than the physical. Our hope is in the Lord. Our hope is in heavenly places. We've been blessed already. Thank you. We've been blessed with spiritual blessings in heavenly places. We don't have to worry about this. It's already dead. It's already taken care of. Sarah, I can't think of that verse. But you have on the wall at home. You just put it on your little board that you change all the letters on. 2 Timothy 2.15. Thank you. Oh, that's the one I just said. <laughs> Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be shamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. In verse 1 and 2, I'll end with this. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. That's our goal. Verse 3 says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. To be a good soldier, you've got to put on that armor, right? There it is. That's what I was looking for. 316, 2 Timothy 316. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Amen. And is profitable for doctrine, for reproof and correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. I'm not telling you you don't have to learn the Old Testament. It's there for our learning. But our mission is different. Our mission is not against flesh and blood. It's against the souls that are walking on this earth. We need to remember that in our daily lives. Follow those two-footed drivers. <laughs> Box them in somewhere. <laughs> Help them out. That's all I have. Any thoughts?